Again, we're honored that you're here today, and today uh, we have the privilege of hearing from uh, Pastor Gerald Murphy. Uh, Dream Center is located in the short north, and they've been one of our partners now for the last few years, really since they existed. Uh, the director, uh, who happens to be here today, with Chris, where you are right here, Chris Gordon was my youth leader growing up. Come on, somebody. He invested in me back in the day. Saw some potential in me when I was just a little punk. You guys know what I mean, right? It's just what it was. So glad to have you here today. But And uh, he took over in directing the Dream Center, and uh, they've just been growing and expanding. And then just a couple years ago, they brought on a pastor to really help shepherd the staff there and the community of people that God has placed them in. And they're, they're ministering to the homeless and the broken of Central Ohio and the Columbus area and have just done an amazing job. And so they've been a partner of ours now. And so throughout the year, we like to highlight some of our partnerships. And it just so happened uh, that Pastor Gerald was available to preach this weekend. And I thought, you know what? I had lunch with him. I was able to hear his story. I said, it'd be good for you to come and just to share with our people and to connect with them and share what God's doing at the Dream Center, but also what he's doing in you. And uh, I mean, our first two services have just been awesome and what the word that he's brought. And I know today it's going to bless you. And so we're honored uh, to have you and your family with us today. And so can we give a big, warm Adventure Church welcome to Pastor Gerald Murphy from Columbus Dream Center. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing? I got to give you the same warning I gave the last service. I got hiccups. <laughs> so we're just going to see how this flows. It went away once I got into the message last service, so hopefully that happens again. But I'm really glad to be here today, really excited for what God is doing here through Adventure Church. And uh, we cannot express, uh, over-express, I should say, our gratitude uh, from the, the Columbus Dream Center for all that you've done. Your faithfulness and generosity is, is changing lives. And I think it's really important that you understand the impact that you're making. We have the privilege to serve hundreds of guests on a weekly basis, and we, we get to watch God radically change lives. From our volunteers who come in and are connecting to their God-given talents and their gifts to make a difference to those who have been experiencing homelessness. And we've watched them make the incredible transition into stable housing and permanent employment. To our young people who are struggling in school and struggling at home and, and they're now thriving at school and at home. They know Jesus loves them and they're connecting to our youth and, and mentoring programs. To human trafficking victims who are now on the path to freedom. It, it's incredible uh, what we all get to be a part of. And, and again, we would not be able to do what we're doing if it was not for your faithful partnership. So give yourselves a round of applause. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. You know, you may not meet the lives of those that, that you're changing, but, but we, we come here to tell you that, that you're truly making a difference. So thank you. Um, before we get into the message today, you know, I want to share a little bit of, of my story. I haven't always been chasing after God's plan for my life. You know, when I go back to when I first came to know the Lord, I was a young man. I was, I think, nine or ten years old when I got baptized, and we were going to a church, and, and around 12 years old, the, the church split. And, you know, for me, it was just the adults couldn't get along. You know, that was my 12-year-old, you know, filter to try to make sense out of what happened. And, you know, during that same time, my, my father had a stroke. He's still alive. He's had a few strokes and uh, actually a couple dozen mini strokes over the last few years. Um, but he's actually he's still alive and he's doing really well. But to experience both of those things at the age of 12, as you can imagine, was, was difficult to process. And so from 12 to 20, you know, I walked away from the Lord, or at least, at least I thought I had. I wasn't living for him. I wasn't, you know, uh, seeking his desire for my life whatsoever. But I'm so grateful that his love, his mercy, and his grace pursued me even when I thought that I had stopped pursuing him. And uh, I stand here today only because of Jesus Christ, only because of the faithfulness of the Lord. And at 20 years old, I gave my heart back to the Lord and, and said, all right, I'm tired of running. I want to do things your way. And I've been on an, an incredible adventure over these last 10 years. My beautiful wife, Lauren, is here. Say hi, Lauren. <laughs> We've got, yeah, you can clap for her. Amen. <laughs> Especially when you find out we have four kids. Now you really should clap for her. Um, but we have a seven, five, three, and 10-month-old, and so we're having a, a ball. We could definitely use your prayers, so, you know, after today, keep us on your prayer list. But we're having a blast, and it's just been an incredible journey. We'll be uh, celebrating our 10-year wedding anniversary here in August, and, and, and God has just been doing amazing things. 
You know, we got involved in ministry uh, early on. I was 23 when, when we became the young adult pastors of the church that we were at. And about halfway through that, we did that for five years. Uh, halfway through that, I'd finished my master's degree in Christian history and theology from Ashland Theological Seminary. And the church wanted to, to build a school of ministry. And so I agreed to help get that started, help get that launched. And it was really important to us that we didn't just start a school that, you know, students came to and sat in classes and, and learned concepts and principles and theories. But we really wanted to make sure that there was an outlet for our students to engage in, in real ministry. And so we, we searched for a partner in Columbus that we felt would serve that, that purpose. And, and the Columbus Dream Center had just started about a year before that. And so they became um, our partner. And it, it was an incredible relationship from the beginning. And so we, we were so grateful to have that place to send our students as they went through our program. And so after that year, Chris and I actually met, and in the spring of 2017, he let me know that the Columbus Dream Center was looking to bring on a pastor. And so I've been able, uh, again, to serve as the pastor of the Columbus Dream Center since then, and it's just been amazing. So uh, really excited for the future, really excited for what God, again, is doing in our city and our region. And I'm so excited for what God is doing here at Adventure Church, and I'm grateful to be here today. You know, when I thought about the message that I would share and what it is that God would have, uh, you know, all of us to hear as we you know, go into this week, I wanted to talk about something that I really feel we, we all can relate to, and it's destiny. I believe every single one of us as, as human beings, we, we desire to know our destiny. And I think it's important as Christians that we, we recognize there's, there's a rhythm, there's a path, you know, there's an actual journey that we can go on intentionally to position ourselves to walk in the destiny that God has for us. So that's what we're going to talk about for a little bit this morning. And so before I get into the word, if you would please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for today. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for your presence. Every time we have the opportunity to come together and worship you and, and be together in your presence and lift up the name of Jesus, it is a gift it is a privilege and it's an honor. And so, God, we ask that you would just continue to increase our awareness of your presence. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would guide and lead us into all truth this morning as you've promised to do. I ask that you would anoint the ears and the hearts of those receiving this word, but also anoint the words that are coming out of my mouth. And Father, I pray in advance and I thank you in advance that, that what we're going to hear today is going to make a difference in our lives that we'll be able to apply it to how we go into this next week and that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to look into 2 Samuel chapter 7. That's where we're going to hang out uh, this morning. And we're going to look at a few verses, and we're going to delve into the life of David. He's one of my favorite heroes of the faith. And we're going to look and see how through his life this pathway to destiny was shaped and formed. So let's read 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. The Bible says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it for the Lord is with you. We're going to jump down to verse 8. Now, this is God telling the prophet to respond to David. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from the tending of the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. And verse 11 says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I think as we look at this passage, there's, there's a few principles, there's a few truths that we can pull from to help us better position and posture ourselves to walk down this pathway to destiny. One of the first things I noticed, and I actually didn't notice it till last night as I was looking over my notes one more time, is that in the first verse, we see this significant mention of rest. The Bible says, after the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies. Now, when we look at the life of David, he was fighting kings and kingdoms. He was up against nations, and, and many of us, you know, 
might not be able to relate to going out on the battlefield and fighting against a, an enemy army. But there's other enemies that we all face on a regular basis. The enemy of fear, the enemy of worry, the enemy of anxiety, the enemy of, of insecurity and a lack of self-worth. And I believe today the Lord is wanting us to recognize that he is able to give us rest from those enemies. And if we are going to respond to this pathway to destiny, we need to learn to live out of the rest that our Heavenly Father promises to provide to us. You were not meant to go after the purpose and the call of God in your life, striving. You were not meant to respond to what he's called you to out of a, a self-effort and, and out of a self-pressure. But he's invited us to live life out of the beauty of his rest. And I'm telling you, it's worth contending for. It's worth rearranging our lives. Rest is something that many of us can't even identify with. Life is so chaotic. It moves at such a fast pace. We're going from here to there and back again all the time. But as believers, we have been invited to live life out of this rest. In verse 8, we see that, that God tells the prophet to go and, and remind David the faithfulness of the Lord throughout his journey. He says, remind him that, that it's the Lord I'm the one who took him from the pasture when he was just tending the flock and prepared him to be king over Israel. And I can guarantee you, as, as David was taking care of smelly sheep, he was not thinking about being king one day. But when we read his story, we see how intentionally he tended the flock unto the Lord. That's where so many of his psalms and his poems were written. As he's doing just the ordinary mundane work of being a shepherd, as, as, as he was doing that, all the while God is preparing him to be king. And there's so much power in finding contentment where we are on our pathway to destiny. Being able to do whatever is right in front of us unto him. Singing songs while we're at it. And this is so important. And then in verse 11, we see this powerful principle that God says, I will be the one to establish a house for you. I will be the one to establish the kingdom. And in our lives, we can find ourselves in a, in a place where we've, we've begun to get a glimpse of what God wants to do, and then we immediately get up, and we think that we have to be the one to run out and do it all. Almost as if we're just taking instructions from him instead of really partnering with him. But what he's telling us here is that he wants to be the one to establish the work. And no matter how much energy and time and investment that comes out of our self-strength, if we establish it, most likely it's not going to last. Now, I'm not against working hard. I'm not against diligence. But there's a way to do it with God in mind every step of the way, side by side, hand in hand with him, out of that rest. And when he establishes that thing, it will last. So as we go through this passage, here are just a few things I want us to consider. If we're going to really respond and go on this pathway to destiny, the first thing I think that we have to take into consideration is God's design. What is God's design for humanity, for creation? What is his big picture purpose for whatever it is that we are going to respond to as sons and daughters of God? It's always meant to point back and connect back to what God always intended. And when we look at the reality of God's original intent and design, we don't have to, to flip through the Bible very long to find it. It's in the first chapter of the first book. Genesis 1, 26, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. This was God's original intent. This was his original design, and he has not changed his mind. And so whatever it is that we are connecting to as it relates to our destiny, it has to go back to this. You know, what we find very early on is that, that God gets pleasure out of our partnering with him. He desires for us as his sons and daughters to be co-laborers 
with his purpose, that through us, we would be the vehicles, we would be the instruments through which his purpose and plan becomes a reality in the earth. You know, this is why Jesus teaches us how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. And how does he intend to accomplish that? Through you and through me. Now, does he need our help? Absolutely not. None of us were there when he spoke the worlds and they became, when he said, let there be light, and it shot forth from his mouth. It's not a matter of him needing our help, but it's actually the truth that he desires. He finds delight in us as his sons and daughters, his image bearers, to be the ones through which his purposes are made reality in the earth. That is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. You know, I think about John chapter 1, verse 12. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because there's so much power in its simplicity. You ask yourself, how do I qualify to be a part of this process? All it takes is being a son and a daughter of God. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, John 1, 12 tells us, to as many as receive Jesus and believe in his name, to them is given the right or given the power to become sons and daughters of God. And from that moment, you have been enlisted. You have been brought into this incredible reality of partnering and co-laboring with God to see his purposes fulfilled. As we recognize this, I think it's important that, that before we can ever fully see and understand and carry the weight of our purpose, we have to know God's design for our personhood. In other words, what I just shared cannot be something that we just see in the Bible and and feel distant from, but we've got to take this personally. God has called you, God has called me to reflect his image and to steward creation. Psalm 139, 13 says, for we were created by God, that he created us in the inmost being, and he knit us together while we were still in our mother's womb. Psalm 8, 3 through 5 is one of my favorite passages that really breaks this down. The psalmist asks this question. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? In other words, the psalmist is saying, when I consider the brilliance, the radiance, the brightness of the sun and the moon and the stars, why do you care so much about me? And for some of us, that's where we need to start. You know, God is not intimidated by questions like that. But it actually draws us closer to him when we're vulnerable. When we just say, God, I don't even understand your love. I don't understand how you could love someone like me. What is it that's so great about me, God, that you even keep me on your mind? And we get the answer to the question in this passage. Verse 5, it says, you have made them, speaking of us, human beings, a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. That word angels in this verse is actually the word Elohim. It's a a name of God. It's one of the many names for God. And so a lot of scholars and a lot of translations even take this verse and and they have it to say, you have made us a little lower than yourself. But he didn't stop there. It goes on to say that we have a crown, and that crown is glory and honor. And from the moment you were washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you died and resurrected with him, you received a crown. And that crown is glory and honor. Maybe this is the crown that we will throw at his feet when we see him in his throne amongst the elders and the angels and the living creatures. But I'm here to tell you this morning that today, When you go to work tomorrow, Monday morning, you have a crown on your head, and it's glory and honor. The verse goes on to tell us that he's made us rulers over the works of his hands, and he's put everything under our feet. And again, this reminds us of that original design of the garden. Right there in Genesis 126, he has not changed his mind. You see, only when we understand our personhood, only when we understand God's design for who we were called to be as human beings, will we be able to then respond and and go after the things that he's called us to do. 
I say oftentimes that, that we are human beings. We're not human doings. And some of us need permission to be. And that, that you would understand that God's heart is to meet you right there, to convince you of his love for you, his affirmation over you, that you would find your worth, your satisfaction, your value in his love. And then out of the overflow of that, respond wherever he's given you influence, whether you're a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, an architect, a mother, a father. We've been called to live that out through this rest and through this confidence of who we are as human beings made in his image. I'm telling you, if we don't learn this, the weight of our purpose will crush us. Only when we know God's design for our humanity can we handle the knowledge of God's design for our purpose. We know that God's purpose is good. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but plans to give you hope and a future. So after we recognize God's design, we're ready to move on. And, and, and out of knowing God's design, we can step into a freedom to dream with him. And I believe that's the second thing that, that we see in this passage, even with David. You see, David's sitting there in his palace, and he, he's recognizing all of the favor and the blessing that God has given him. And he says to himself, it's not right for me to be sitting here in this palace and in God's ark, the presence of God, to still be in a tent. I want to build a house for him. And I believe that desire, that dream of David came out of the intimacy that he had with the Lord. I believe if you look through all the Psalms, you will see all of the, the scriptures that, that point back to this, this reality of God's presence dwelling with his people and us with him. I don't know if, if David had a copy of Genesis on his bookshelf and he would have read himself the reality of Adam and Eve walking with, with, with God in the cool of the day. And there was something in David's heart that says, I want that again in the earth. And I want to be the one to establish that. I want to be the one to build that. And it reminds me of the scripture in Psalm 37, verse 4. The Bible says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You see, this is how we dream with God. I know there's a lot of preachers who will take that verse and say, hey, you know, you have a desire for a Lamborghini. Well, God's going to give that to you. I don't necessarily agree with that. And so if there's preachers out there preaching that, let's just pray for him, bless him, God. He'll take care of it. But I don't really believe that that's what this verse is talking about. I believe the instructions that were being given is that we should take delight in God, that we should find our pleasure, we should find our satisfaction in relationship, communion, fellowship, and intimacy with him. And in that place, there's a location Well, he will then begin to share his desires with us. He will then begin to release Dreams to us that are in line and in step with his very own dreams, and they become our own. And I believe this is the heart of the Lord, and I believe this is what David was tapping into. Once we recognize the invitation to know God's design, once we respond to taking delight in the Lord, and in that place he shares his heart and his dreams with us, we're ready for the path to destiny. Let's define destiny. Something to which a person or thing is destined. I don't know about you, but anytime the word that I'm looking to understand is in the definition, it doesn't help me very much. So let's just unpack it. The reality is our destiny is the, the, the culmination of our lives, the point to which we were destined and the point to which that we were prepared and, and purposed to wind up when it's all said and done. But we don't have to be like others in the world who depend on fortune cookies and, and different things like that to recognize our destiny, for our destiny is in God himself. And as we read through this a little bit more, we're going to recognize that we share a common destiny. And so we're going to talk about that. But once we know God's design, commit to live out the dreams he has given us, we find ourselves on this pathway to destiny. Our destiny is not the sum of what we do. It is the reality of who we become on the journey. And I really hope that that lands with you today. Our destiny, it is not the sum of our accomplishments and our achievements. There's so many people in the world trying to get to that next goal and that next goal and that next goal 
only to find that the next goal doesn't satisfy them any more than the last goal did. The destination in itself isn't even the destiny, but it's the journey hand in hand with the Lord, hand in hand with our Heavenly Father, and the process through which he takes us to look more like him, where his character and his nature, the fruit of the Spirit, his kindness, his goodness, his mercy, his righteousness, begins to take shape in our lives. And we see this even in David's story, that God is putting so much more value on the character of the man than what the man accomplishes. This is powerful. First Chronicles 22, 7 and 8. David said to Solomon, his son, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Now, at first, that might seem discouraging. But I believe if we read it the right way, we're going to be encouraged by this. I believe this is giving us an understanding that even in the life of David, who accomplished so much, God was more concerned about the man he was than him even achieving the dream that God had given him. God was willing to wait for the next generation to build his house. Even if just we would learn this important principle that who we are matters more than what we do. You see, our collective invitation and destiny as believers, it's, it's one. And that is to become like Jesus. And if that's not happening along the pathway to destiny, we've missed it. We've missed it. And I love that God himself is not in a rush. David, I'll wait for your son. Because I, I want you to know it was always more about who you are than what you do for me. God does not have employees. He has sons and daughters. He's not just looking for a bunch of workers and laborers. He's looking for sons and daughters who will agree and partner with his heart. Romans 8, 29 and 30 tells us, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is our destiny. This is what we share in common, no matter what your title at your job is or whether you are not even employed right now. This is our collective destiny destiny, to become sons and daughters who reflect the image, the nature, the character, the goodness of the Lord in our everyday lives, with our spouses, with our children, with our co-workers. Everywhere we go, we become the embodiment of the reality of who God is at his very core, the essence of his nature and his character, his love, his mercy, his joy, his peace. People encounter it every time they encounter us. This is our destiny. It's liberating to know that this is what God is most concerned about. And everything that we'll ever do for him is meant to become the result of this place, the overflow of this place. You might say, how do I increase in reflecting his nature and reflecting his character? How do I grow in looking more like Jesus? I'm going to give you one simple thing. Look at him. Look at him. 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 3 tells us that when we see him, we'll become like him. And I believe that is both as we wait for his return, but I also believe it's right now, here in this moment, that we crawl up next to him in his presence and we ask Holy Spirit to reveal to us who Jesus is. We pour over the gospels and we see this man who, who stopped at a well to minister to the Samaritan woman. We, we think about the reality of, of his life and his ministry and as we gaze upon him, we become more like him. So where do we go from here? I want to give you three things as we talk about the destiny and our pathway toward it. Number one, fall in love with God's design through the word. Maybe this is something you've never really considered. Maybe this is something that you've never spent time really looking into. 
but take some time and really look over the word and see what it says about God's original plan, design, and purpose for you, for humanity, and the earth. Number two, allow him to share his dreams with you. And that happens in continued worship, fellowship, and intimacy with him. And number three, commit to walking toward your destiny, knowing that who you become along the way matters more than what you accomplish. For looking like Jesus, this alone is our common destiny. Go ahead and stand to your feet with me. We're going to worship one more time. And I just want to pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you again for this time that we've had together in your presence. We thank you for the power and the truth of your word. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would come, that you would illuminate the word in our hearts, that you would allow us the ability to respond to it in faith, that you would pour out grace, that this would not be a word that stays in the room, but Lord, it would be something that actually affects how we live this week, that we would do it out of rest. Lord, we thank you and we love you. We commit to grow in the understanding of of your design. We would posture ourselves to receive your dreams until they become our own. Lord, we say yes to your invitation to our common destiny to look and become more like Jesus, reflecting your image, your nature, your character to the world around us. You're worthy, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man, can we just show our appreciation for that word today? You know, I've been in this thing called ministry now for a long time, almost 16 years I've been doing this, and I'll meet with people so often. And a lot of times, too, when they're coming to know Christ and really discovering who Jesus is, they question the path that they're on. And, you know, I'm, I just don't find fulfillment in this career, and, and I'm, I'm kind of stuck in this season, and I just can't get out of it. And I feel like God has more for me, yet I just can't seem to to grab hold of it, to find that fulfillment. What Gerald told us today, I I hope that it encourages you. When I'll tell someone in that season, I'll say, I know you feel like that, but do you love God? They'll go, of course I love God. Do you you feel like he's got a plan and purpose for your life? Yeah, of course, I I do feel like he has a plan and purpose for your life. It's like, okay, but you have to redefine what success is for you then. Because success isn't some destination. It's not some place that we're trying to get. Success as a Christ follower is defined as faithful obedience to God every day. In other words, I'll say to them, listen, I know you may feel like there's more and God may just have more for you. But until he reveals it, until he opens the door, do you know what you do? You bloom exactly where you're planted. Because God's mission in this world He said, I came to seek and save lost people. And he said, here's the command I'm giving you. This is it. This is the trump card that God told his followers. You are to love me with everything that you got. Heart, soul, mind, body, strength. You love me with that kind of passion and pursuit. He said, and then you are to love others the same way. And so no matter where you're at today, friend, no matter what job you may be in, no matter... If you're a stay-at-home mom and you're struggling to find significance outside of the home, I don't know where you're at, but wherever you're at, you know what you can do? You can love God with everything that you have every day. You know the next thing you can do? Is you can love others as Jesus has called us to love Him. No matter where you're at, we can always do those things. It takes no talent. It takes no gifting. It takes no more education. It takes nothing else just to say, God, today I wake up. Lord, I connect with you. You're my creator. You're my God. I need you. My desire is to serve and to please you, God. So give me eyes to see the way you see. And then as you go out about your day and that coworker is there and you know they're struggling, you can become the hands and feet of Jesus to them. You can pause to pray for them as you're going through to get your latte at Starbucks. You can look at that worker and say, you know what, I just want you to be encouraged today. I believe God has a plan for your life. What's your name? I'll be praying for you today. As you go through the checkout line at Kroger, as you get your kids ready in the morning, everything we do, the Bible says, can be as worship unto the Lord. 
And church, that's the secret sauce. You want God to open doors for you? Love him. Love people. Become about his work. Become about his mission in the world. And God will do extraordinary things through your life. But it often comes, the extraordinary often comes through the very ordinary things that we do. So don't miss it. Have eyes to see, ears to hear. Be obedient to what the Lord speaks to you. That is what it means to fulfill, not your dream, his dream for you. Amen. Father, we thank you again.